Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Creativity, Montessori, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do online on Instagram under at Robin underscore Norgren or at UBU for Life. This is from a book called The Enchanted Hour by Megan Cox Corden. A team of neurologists discovered that the brains of young children whose parents read aloud to them often and who had access to more children's books had more robust activation than their peers. In other words, the brains of well-read two preschoolers seemed more agile and receptive to narrative, suggesting that they had a greater capacity to process more of what they were hearing and at faster speeds. This was a study to show that the early home reading environment, which is to say a child's access to books and frequency of shared reading with a grown-up, makes a quantifiable difference in brain function, and therefore it stands to reason in brain development. The researchers believe that because well-read to children have greater experience with language and imagination during story time, they will enjoy a cognitive advantage over peers who have not. A preschool teacher told me that she and her co-workers can always spot the well-read to children. They come in the morning and many of them will go straight to the books and say, will you read me this book? And they're like looking for a lap, she said. At which point she stood up and what waggled her bottom like a three-year-old trying to find a seat. The study that I mentioned involves stories without pictures that children listen to through headphones, which suggested that the clinicians had that to the clinicians that activation in these visual processing areas represents imagination. Children with greater experience of being read to were, it seemed, better at summoning images in their mind's eye than young children who hadn't been exposed to a lot of books and reading aloud. Well, you might ask, what of it? It's, a logic, it's logical that a brain accustomed to certain stimuli is going to develop a greater capacity to handle those stimuli. Why does it matter? What difference does it make? It matters because children's early years are a time of such intense formation. The young brain is plastic, adaptable, and growing like mad. In the first 12 months, a baby's brain doubles in size. By a child's third birthday, his brain has completed 85% of all the growth it will have. The sensitive period when synapses are forming for language and many other higher cognitive functions peaks when a child is two. By the end of the first five years, a child has passed through all the most rapid stages of development involving language, emotional control, vision, hearing, and habitual ways of responding. Early experiences in the firing and wiring of neurons create the architecture of a small child's mind, laying the pathways for future thought and reasoning. Reading storybooks turns out to be an extraordinarily efficient and productive way to cause messages to zing from one part of the brain to another, creating and reinforcing those important neural connections. Reading aloud is so constructive in its regard in fact, that in 2014, the American Academy of Pediatrics advised its 62,000 member doctors to recommend daily reading aloud to the parents and children they see in their medical practices. Reading regularly with young children, the group's policy paper read, stimulates optimal patterns of brain development and strengthens parent-child relationships at a critical time in child development, which in turn builds language, literacy, and social-emotional skills that last a lifetime. Optimal patterns of brain development, stronger parent-child relationships, skills that last a lifetime. If reading aloud were a pill, every child in the country would get a prescription. Instead, we're giving them screens. Here's some thoughts from a book called The Burning Word by Judith M. Kunst on the topic of Midrash. 
If the meaning of scripture is hidden in the text, then language and the tools of language become very important. I sensed this dimly even before I learned about Midrash, for after college, without knowing precisely why, I rejected a long-held dream of entering a Christian seminary and enrolled instead in a graduate program to study creative writing. Just a few months before I met the teacher who pointed me toward the Hebrew tradition, I was startled by another teacher's observation. In class one day, this professor handed out excerpts from three different poems. We're to choose one and write our own rhythmically exact imitation. Suddenly she looked at me and said, be sure you don't choose the poem from the book of Job. To my quizzical stare, she said, don't you know you already write in the rhythms of the Bible? Rhythms? Bible. My writing. How was it that without my awareness, the music and pulse of ancient Hebrew psalms and stories had reverberated through my reading, into my writing, and out to someone else's ear? I was hungry to know more. Could that mysterious God-filled space, that powerful swirl of feelings I'd found in a childhood painting of Jesus, be entered more deliberately, explored more concretely with language? I started reading my Bible again, not for its comforting, familiar passages, but rather for its rhythm, language, imagery, juxtaposition, all the tools I was experimenting with as a writer. There in my Bible, I found writing stranger and more beautiful than anything I myself could hope to compose. And in all that strangeness, I found the Creator hiding. Imagine the branch of an almond tree. God says to the prophet Jeremiah, imagine a broken bowl. To the prophet Ezekiel, he says, lie on your side for a hundred days. And to the prophet Hosea, marry your wife three times. To King David, he calls out, write me a hundred poems. And to the exiles, Shadrach and Meshach, sing me a hymn of fire. To all Israel, God says, if you seek me, you will ever surely find me. And then insists, I will be found by you. From the human scriptures, I moved to a fresh reading of the Greek scriptures. And though I'd been reading them my whole life, I was looking now for strangeness and beauty, reading as a lover of words. In the beginning was the word, describes, declares the gospel writer John, and the word was with God and the word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. This image, written roughly around the same time that the ancient rabbis began reinterpreting the Torah, makes intriguing connection between Judaism and Jesus. Jesus, in, in John's view, is God's language, is in fact God's most ancient and most intimate utterance to us. The more I learn about Midrash seeking to read the Bible with Jewish eyes, the more the dividing lines start to blur between John's gospel image, my mother's lullaby hymn, and that early rabbi's Tumultic proverb, these days, to turn my eyes upon Jesus can't be separated from turning my eyes upon the words of God's other precious utterance, the Bible. To take all its words and turn them again and again in my mouth, in my mind, and on the blank page before me. This way of reading does not require technical or scholarly expertise, though such knowledge can richly add to our conversation with the Bible. What Midrash does is require close attention, playful imagination, deep reverence, and the courage to continually turn toward the words that trouble us. What does it mean in actual practice? What does it mean to make Midrash? Summed up simply, making Midrash involves four steps. Choose a text. Find in its language a problem or a question. Draw an answer out of your imagination that solves the problem or in some way illuminates new meaning in the text. Then find someone to argue with your interpretation, expand upon it, 
or propose a different answer altogether. Austin Kleon writes in his book, Steal Like an Artist, write fan letters. When I was younger, I wrote a lot of fan letters and had the good fortune to hear back from several of my heroes. But I've realized the trouble with fan letters is that there's built-in pressure for the recipient to respond. A lot of times when we write fan letters, we're looking for a blessing or an affirmation. As my friend Hugh McLeod says, the best way to get approval is to not need it. If you truly love someone's work, you shouldn't need a response from them. And if the person you want to write to has been dead for a hundred years, you're really out of luck. So I recommend public fan letters. The internet is really good for this. Write a blog post about someone's work that you admire and link to their site. Make something and dedicate it to your hero. Answer a question they've asked, solve a problem for them, or improve on their work and share it online. Maybe your hero will see your work. Maybe he or she won't. Maybe they'll respond to you. Maybe not. The important thing is that you show your appreciation without expecting anything in return and that you get new work out of the appreciation. Validation is for parking. Craig DeMauer says, Modern art equals, I could do that, plus, yeah, but you didn't. The trouble with creative work sometimes, by the time people catch on to what's valuable about your work and about what you do, you're either A, bored to death with it, or B, dead. You can't go looking for validation from external sources. Once you put your work into the world, you have no control over the way people will react to it. Ironically, really good work often appears to be effortless. People will say, why didn't I think of that? They won't see the years of toil and sweat that went into it. Not everybody will get it. People will misinterpret you and what you do. They might even call you names. So get comfortable with being misunderstood, disparaged, or ignored. The trick is to be do bu too busy doing your work to care. Keep a praise file. Life is a lonely business, often filled with discouragement and rejection. Yes, validation is for parking, but it's still a tremendous boost when someone says nice things about our work. Occasionally, I have the good fortune to have something take, take off online, and for a week or two, I'm swimming in tweets and nice emails from people discovering my work. It's pretty wonderful, and disorienting, and a major high. But I always know that the high will taper off, and a few weeks down the road I will have a dark day when I want to quit, when I wonder why the heck I even bother with this stuff. And that's why I put every really nice email into a special folder. Nasty emails get deleted immediately. When those dark days roll around and I need a boost, I open that folder and read through a couple of emails. Then I get back to work. Try it. Instead of keeping a rejection file, keep a praise file. Use it sparingly. Don't get lost in past glory. But keep it around for when you need the lift. Mm -hmm.